We've seen how firms react in the short run. We've seen their uh, short run cost curves, the whole idea that firms exist to maximize profit. In this video, we're going to carry on with this whole discussion of producer theory, the whole discussion of our cost curves, but we're going to switch our focus from this short run time period into the long run. Keep in mind our big determinant that determines, hey, are we in the short run, are we in the long run, distinguishes between these two is whether or not we have a fixed factor of production. In our case, what we're focusing on is in the short run, we can choose our level of labor, capital is fixed. When we transition to the long run, well, capital can now be chosen as well. And thus the choice comes for the firm, how much capital do I employ? How much labor do I employ? Is there an optimal ratio between these two? Let's take a look at how the producer deals with this long run problem and work through it from there. So when thinking about the long run, the first thing to kind of remember is that really what the long run is, is just a series of short runs. And we can demonstrate this with the following kind of, now you can think about it in this kind of graph. So we'll have here, we'll put on our horizontal axes time and on our vertical axes, we'll do our quantity of capital, how much capital we have available to us. Well, what we have is in the short run, we have our level of capital being fixed. So just boom, some fixed level of capital. However, eventually we may want to change, we may want to update our capital mix, change how much equipment, machinery, etc., that we have. And so we get to that point and we decide, yeah, we're going to buy a bunch of new capital. And when we make the capital acquisition, and essentially what has just happened is we've just transitioned from one short run period to another short run period, right? And this can continue. This can continue. We can have another jump. We can have, okay, business is going good. We want to get a, another influx of capital. Maybe we build another factory. And that brings us now to short run three. And then maybe, oops, uh, business is slowing down. That's too much. We need to liquidate some of our capital. And there we go. We can get rid of some of that capital and bring us to short run four. So while we have a series of short runs here, where in each short run, the level of capital is fixed, all of this together, all of these together are the long run. And so in this sense here, our long run capital can be chosen. We can change our level of capital as needed, as needed. But what this means is just a series of short runs. And that's the best way to kind of think about this. Then attached to this is just, well, okay, great. We get to pick our level of labor. We get to pick our level of capital. We can kind of take a look to realize that, okay, we can pick our level of labor. We can pick our level of capital. Let's draw this here. There's going to be my capital. There's my level of labor. I ultimately want to pick these two factors of production in such a way to satisfy my reason for being in business. And okay, I purposely kind of worded that vaguely because this is a chance. Think for yourself again, what is our fundamental assumption about the role of firms? Why do they exist? Well, what we said is that our big assumption is that they exist to maximize profit. And if we want to think about this, right, profit has, all right, we've taken a look at this two aspects. We have our total revenue and we have our total costs. So really in order to maximize profit, this is actually twofold. On the one side, we can maximize profit by boosting our revenues, getting the highest revenues we possibly could. On the other hand, well, we could boost our profits by being cost minimizing get the lowest possible costs we could. And in fact, this is what we're gonna look at in our case here. We're gonna presume that in this total revenue, right? Keep in mind, we said total revenue was okay. The price we sell it for times the quantity that we're producing. We're gonna presume that we have some optimal quantity that we know. I'm gonna call that Q star. And I know exactly how much units I should be producing, exactly what the market wants to buy from me, where this Q star comes from, don't get too caught up on that yet. We'll come back to it. But this is our ideal quantity produced. This is our target. This is what we want to hit. Price? Ah, we can't influence that. This is just exogenous. It's dictated to us by the market. So dictated to us, 
we figured out this perfect level of production. Well, okay, that seems rather fixed. Can't do much with that. So how do I maximize my profit? Well, I maximize my profit by minimizing my costs. And okay, how do I minimize my costs? Well, knowing that I have this level of Q star, thinking about, hey, my quantity is just going to be some function of labor and capital. You can imagine there's actually going to be a number of different combinations of labor and capital that together give me this value of Q star. And we're going to presume that, okay, these many, many different combinations of labor and capital can be displayed graphically. And we're just going to, again, just for simplicity, we're just going to presume linearity between these two. That likely is not the case. We're probably looking at quite a convex curve, but we're going to presume linearity for the simplicity here, such that every point of capital and labor along this curve, if we picked any point and threw it into this production, uh, production function, we would get Q star being produced. That is, we would call this curve this curve has a special name, we would call it an isoquant, meaning same quantity. Every point along this line would be the same quantity being produced, such that labor and capital is perfectly matched. I shouldn't say perfectly matched, such that the value of labor and capital going into this function give us this value of Q star. There's actually many points along here which wouldn't be ideal or wouldn't be perfectly matched. But that turns out to be the problem that the producer wants to solve. The producer wants to determine what is going to be my optimal, what is going to be my cost minimizing the cheapest way in order to produce Q star units. Right, you can imagine, technically, producer could probably completely automate the entire production process and make everything with just capital. But now nah, that might not be the most cost effective. Very similarly, they could throw, just keep throwing bodies at the problem. And just with a massive amounts of labor, we could just simply will this to be, right? But again, likely not very efficient. Likely this would be quite expensive to do as well. Ideally, there's going to be somewhere, somewhere in the middle here, such that we have, and I just picked the point literally in the middle, but it could be anywhere along this line, some point such that we have this optimal ratio of capital and labor, such that we are producing Q star in the least cost fashion. So how, how do we find this? How do we find this point? Well, the way we find this point all comes back to our introduction from last time, where we were talking about this kind of law of diminishing marginal returns, right? And we said that, hey, with labor, we took a look at this with our product curves. We said as we added more and more and more workers, well, the amount of extra output for an extra worker became less and less and less and less. That is because as we add more people, they become less and less effective. Well, you can imagine because they're producing less, but you're paying them the same, the more people we add, the more costly they become. So, okay, there's we have a diminishing return going on there. Very similarly, we'd have the same thing with capital. We'd have diminishing marginal returns of capital. As we add more and more equipment, more and more machines, well, the initial machine is hugely productive. But as we add more and more and more, every additional machine offers less and less additional output, such that, well, okay, we're paying the same amount for each extra machine, they're producing less extra stuff, while our cost per unit of capital is thus increasing as well. So, okay, we have a ratio here. Too much capital becomes increasingly expensive and less and less productive. Too much labor becomes increasingly expensive and less and less productive. But if we can balance it right, we can find a nice little place here. Keep in mind, one of the things we were talking about was both the amount of capital as well as the price of capital and the amount of labor, as well as the price of labor, which would be our wage rate. So we have our marginal product of capital to consider, we have our marginal product of labor to consider, and the prices of each. 
Now, being a 100 level class, we're not gonna get into the derivation of this as to where it comes from, but what we're just gonna do is we're just gonna wave our hands, a little bit of smoke and mirrors, and we're gonna say that we can find this optimal ratio of labor and capital at the point where this holds, where the marginal product of capital all over the price of capital is equal to the marginal product of labor all over the price of labor. So, okay, price of labor, we can update that. We can make that a little bit more to the point. Marginal product of labor, that's our wage rate. If this holds, right, so marginal product of capital over price of capital, one and the same as the marginal product of labor over the price of labor, we are at a least cost method of production. And let's just think about why this is the case, right? Keeping in mind that I'm cost minimizing. So marginal product of capital, let's just think about that for a second. Marginal product of capital, that is the change in output for a change in capital. So it's saying, okay, I threw in one more piece of capital, how much extra output I got. Okay, if I'm getting a whole bunch of extra output here, right, so boom, whole bunch of extra output for my marginal product of capital for a really cheap price, well, this here is really going to be a big number. It's saying, hey, I'm getting a lot of value. I'm getting a lot of production from my capital, and it's cheap, right? In that case there, I'd have something like this. Marginal product of capital over price of capital is greater than my marginal product of labor over my wage, right? Again, that means that I'm getting, maybe this is plus one unit of capital, and I got from this plus 100 units being produced, right? So massive marginal product of capital going on here for a really cheap price of capital. Okay, capital is looking good, capital is productive, if I'm trying to profit maximize, cost minimize, what's my most effective, what's my most productive factor of input right now? Well, my most productive factor of um, factor of production is gonna be the one that's giving me the most output per dollar spent. This guy, right? This guy right here, it's giving me a hundred units per dollar spent on it for the last piece of capital added. That's pretty good. So what am I gonna do? I'm going to want to buy more capital. And if I'm buying more capital, keep in mind, right? Let's go back up to our isoquant. If I'm buying more capital for this Q star, this fixed quantity, well, what does that mean? More capital still producing Q star. It means less labor. So it means I'm going to get rid of some of my labor. I'm going to automate their jobs. I'm going to replace these workers with machinery. So let's take a look at what happens with that. Let's take a look what happens with that. So buy more capital. So buy more capital means I'm going to lay off some of my workers. So capital up, labor down. Cool, but wait, we don't actually have explicitly capital or labor in here. We have marginal product of capital and we have marginal product of labor. Well, okay, let's, let's take a quick step back and let's recall the diagram we were looking at in our, last, in our last video. We had, and again, this was for labor, but we could very easily do it for capital as well. We have labor, we have output per labor, and we had our, marginal product of labor, right? Such that here was our point of congestion and then every point that we added of labor beyond that point, we were experiencing diminishing marginal returns. Output per worker got less and less and less and less as I added each additional worker. So, okay, we had this relationship very similarly. I could do the exact same diagram. It would look identical I would just update all the L with K, K, and K, right? So marginal product of capital, as I add more units of capital, my output per unit of capital would be getting smaller, 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 smaller. So, okay, again, diminishing marginal returns to capital. 
What does this mean then? Well, let's go back. I'm buying more capital. If I'm buying more capital, well, I'd be increasing my capital, meaning my marginal product of capital would be falling. I'm laying off some workers. Okay, so as I'm laying off workers, less workers, right? Less workers means I'm moving this way, meaning what's happening to my marginal product of labor? Well, my marginal product of labor is actually increasing. So in that case there, buying more capital, every extra unit becomes less and less effective. As I lay off people, that last unit of labor that I have is becoming increasingly productive. This trade-off will continue to happen until our new value of marginal product of capital all over our price of capital is going to be one and the same as our new value of our marginal product of labor all over the price of labor. And again, with this, we're going to have a new updated optimal ratio of capital and labor. And again, you're kind of like, okay, Keith, but show me why, why is this cost minimizing? There isn't really a great way to show you this that makes easy. Um, I will get an Excel spreadsheet put together for those who want to dig deeper that shows this in a numerical fashion, but it's not just an easy, straightforward thing to show without a bit more math involved with it. So right now, again, like I said, in a 100 level class, we're just going to wave our hands. We're going to do smoke and mirrors and say, hey, this equation here defines an optimal ratio of labor to capital. If ever one side is bigger than the other side, whatever the bigger one is, that is what is giving us more output per dollar spent. More output per dollar spent is better for the business. That's what we want more of. So whichever side's bigger, we'll buy more of the bigger side, less of the smaller side. We'll do that, we'll re-equate, and we'll get an optimal ratio of labor and capital. That's really the big thing optimal ratio of labor and capital when this is true such that we are cost minimizing cost minimization okay what do we do with this well we took a look last time at our short run cost curves this time what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at our long run cost curve and so in the long run because well okay what's our definition of the long run long run we get to choose our labor we get to choose our capital but our technology is fixed well okay if we had to choose our labor and we're going to choose our capital what did we have we had total cost we had total variable cost we had total fixed cost this was my labor cost this was my capital cost but keep in mind this was in the short run this was in the short run where this was my capital cost because it was fixed. In our case now, well, in our case, we no longer have these fixed costs because we no longer have fixed capital. I get to vary my capital. So now my total variable cost is going to be my total labor cost and my total capital cost. But hey, wait, wait, wait. If I just have a total variable cost, why have total cost and then go total cost equals total variable cost that right I just have two things so what we're going to have is we're not going to have total cost total variable total fixed we are just going to have and to make sure that we differentiate it we're going to have our long run total cost and that's it just a total cost no total variable no total fixed just a total cost and then very similarly, yeah, very similarly, we're going to have a long run average total cost. And again, I don't necessarily need to go average total cost because it's implied. I just have the one average cost I'm considering. So long run average cost. Our graph here, again, in terms of dollars per unit and units. And where our short run cost curves, we said were U-shaped. Our long run cost curves, well, our long run cost curves are going to be more of a saucer shape. And let's see how well I can draw this here given the, uh, given this computer. So it kind of starts to dip down. It's going to hit a minimum. It will have this 
flat stretch, so I'm doing my best to kind of demonstrate, and then it's going to begin to rise back up. And this will be my long run average cost. Okay, what's happening? Well, let's keep in mind that every level of Q being produced here is going to be produced, right? Every point that I pick is going to be such that at that point of Q, the marginal product of labor over the price of labor equals the marginal price of capital all over the price of capital. That is, every Q along this horizontal line would be produced in a cost minimizing way. So that is given the level of technology I have, this long run average cost curve is also my lowest cost curve. I could not have a per unit cost below this line. This is the absolute cheapest method of production available to me given my level of technology. So that's kind of the first big realization to have. Every unit is being made in the absolute cheapest way possible with the perfect ratio of labor to capital. What we have then is this changing shape and it's gonna have a different reason behind it than we did with our short run cost curve, right? With our short run cost curve, we were falling initially as we were taking advantage of our falling, um, falling average returns to labor and then we began to increase due to our diminishing marginal returns. But in this long run, now because we always have a perfect ratio of labor to capital, I'm not getting a diminishing marginal return to labor because I'm always producing every unit here with this perfect ratio. So then why? Why am I initially falling? Why am I then increasing my costs? Well, let's break this curve up into a few different uh, points and we'll talk about each one. So what I want to do is I want to break it up first into, let's use a bit of a thinner line here. Let's break it up first into this decreasing area, into this little flat zone along the bottom, and then my increasing area. So, okay, the first one here, let's talk about that. My first zone, this is where I'm experiencing decreasing costs. And truthfully, this is decreasing average costs. So cost per unit, or I would say I'm experiencing increasing returns to scale. Increasing returns to scale. So two different terms for this first area, we can use it interchangeably. What's happening here? What's happening in this sense? So let's imagine that you are a baker and you're going to start your little bakery uh, bakery shop and you're just going to simply sell cookies, right? So nothing too fancy, just your cookies. Now, initially, you're just making this in your own kitchen, meaning that you're using your kitchen stove, you're using your own labor and you're happy you're making, you know, maybe, well, I don't know, a few dozen cookies a day. Well, if that was what you were happy with, that was your optimal level of cookies, that's all you could sell. The question is, would it really make sense for you to go out and buy one of these massive industrial cookie ovens? Would it make sense for you to hire a whole bunch of extra labor to mix ingredients together, pour them and put them into the, into the big bat to mix together to make these cookies and then into the big industrial cookie oven? Well, no. Right? If you're only making these handful of cookies a day, it really wouldn't make sense for you to do that. But if you were wanting to actually scale up your quantity of cookies, greatly increase your quantity of cookies, well, now what you can do is you can buy this specialty built capital. You can start to hire specialty labor, which is going to increase your quantity faster than it increases your costs. Yes, this big industrial cookie oven is going to be expensive, but it's going to increase your cookie production by so much that your average cost will be falling. These here are scale opportunities, right? So every time you decide to increase your capital, increase your labor, it causes such a drastic increase in your output that your cost per unit is actually falling as a result. It's going to continue to fall, continue to fall until we hit this point here, right where it's our minimum. We're going to refer to this point as our minimum efficient scale. 
So MES, this is our minimum efficient scale. This is where all of our scale opportunities are exhausted, right? There's no longer some better, more specialty capital for you to utilize, uh, specialty labor. This is, this is it. You've taken advantage of all of those opportunities. Now what we have is we have this middle stretch that's more or less flat. And along these, we're going to have our constant costs. So constant, oh, that's not how you spell constant. Constant costs or our constant returns to scale. And with this, keep in mind that what we're talking about when we're saying constant costs, this is actually, again, constant average costs, right? Our per unit costs are staying the same. So yes, our actual costs may be increasing, but they're increasing in proportion with our number of units. That is to say, my costs might double, but my output doubles as well. That is, okay, once we hit this minimum efficient scale, hey, things are going really, really good. I've figured out everything how to do it. I have one bakery currently open. Well, and I'm able to produce QMES at this one bakery open. I could double, I could just replicate this, open up another bakery and just double my output. And by doubling my output, I'm also doubling my costs, but my cost per unit is staying constant. And I have my constant returns to scale. This is great. You can keep doing this until an eventual point here. And once we hit this point, our average cost, our long run average costs begin to actually increase. And through this zone, we now have our increasing costs. Or our decreasing. Decreasing returns to scale. And what's happening here? Why is our average cost, our cost per unit, beginning to rise during this zone? Well, at this point, you've now increased your output by so much. You've created such a large company that you now need to start having cost centers in order to properly manage it. That is, you're going to start putting in divisions into your business that are not adding to your productivity. They're not productive, but they're still necessary. Right? This might be a human resources team. It might be a accounting team, legal team, right? Middle managers. All of these are necessary in order to still maintain your business at the large level. But by engaging in this, while well, they're strictly adding costs, they're not creating more cookies, right? Legal team, great. They're there to make sure that everything's being followed, that you're not being sued if you had a bad batch of cookies or something like that. But they're not actually making you any extra cookies. So it's strictly an increasing cost without an increase in output. Thus our average costs begin to increase. So you can imagine once you hit a certain level of production, any increase in production is going to require added levels of bureaucracy. Those added levels of bureaucracy are just adding to your costs, not your output. And thus we have our full long run average cost curve. Another thing that we want to take a look at with these, though, is the relationship between this long run average cost curve and our short run average cost curve. So let's take a look at that. Let's suppose, let's just draw our diagram again here. So uh, let's use white again. So we're going to have our vertical axis. That is, again, dollars per unit dollars per unit and our horizontal axes, which is output for this long run average cost curve again. Well, this is our saucer shape. Ah, that wasn't too bad, actually. Long run average cost curve. What we want to imagine is how our short run average total cost curves fit into this, right? And keep in mind, yes, we have in the short run, we have our average total cost, we have our average variable cost, and we have our marginal cost. I'm just going to simplify things. I'm going to say we're just going to ignore this average variable cost. We'll just take a look at the average total cost and maybe sometimes we'll pop this marginal cost in. So what we want to do, taking a look at this average total cost curve, how it fits in here, 
What we need to keep in mind is that this long run average cost curve was a least cost curve. It was the most effective, the cheapest way that we could produce any of these units of cap or any of these units of output because we had an optimal ratio of labor and capital. In the short run, well, in the short run, our capital is fixed, right? That's why we have a variable cost because we also have a fixed cost that we didn't write. And so capital is fixed, meaning all I can do to change my output in the short run is to add or change my labor. That is only at one point in the short run would I have an optimal ratio of labor and capital. At every other point, I'm either going to have too much labor or too much capital. And so let's take, let's take a look at that. Let's just identify right here. We'll draw that point down as our minimum efficient scale and we'll take a look at a short run average total cost curve and i'm going to draw it such that they're operating below their minimum efficient scale in this decreasing costs range so what we would have is we'd have our short run average total cost curve coming down it would just touch hit a minimum and then it would come back up all right, keeping in mind the relationship here, long run average cost curve is kind of the saucer shape, short run is U shape. So let's go short run average total cost, and I'm going to go given a capital stock of, I don't know, let's say 50. Right? That number is not really relevant, it's just to say, hey, this is my short run average total cost curve given some fixed level of capital. And what we'll notice is that on this short run average total cost curve, right, we can kind of zoom in to see this. Hey, I am just touching right here. And that's the only spot, right? Everywhere else, I'm just off of my long run average cost curve. That is at this point and only at this point do I have an optimal ratio of labor and capital. As I increase my quantity, that is moved to the right, well, the only way I can increase my quantity is by hiring more people. So as I go this way, I get too much labor versus capital. As I decrease my quantity, well, I'm gonna to have too much capital versus my labor. I'm not gonna have enough workers for that optimal ratio. Only right here do I have an optimal ratio of labor and capital. Keep in mind, we had another point of interest on this short run average total cost curve. We had our minimum point, which in this case is going to be right about here, right? We called that point there the capacity of the firm. So what we find is that in this decreasing costs, this increasing returns to scale, that our short run average total cost curves are going to be tangent with the long run cost curve below capacity. If we carry on, we can take a look at another short run average total cost curve. Let's actually just jump to the other extreme. Let's jump over here. We can have again a short run average total cost curve that is gonna come down, hit a minimum, and then it's gonna to begin to make its way up, just becoming tangent and then carrying on upwards. All right, we'll say that tendency is just right there. And this would be my short run average total cost curve again, given a capital stock of, well, okay, we had 50 over here, very little capital. Over here, let's say this is a capital stock of, I don't know, let's say 300, right? So we need significantly more capital to get over here. And again, okay, minimum short run average total cost curve. That was my capacity of the firm we find that in this increasing costs, decreasing returns to scale, my tangency point is above capacity, right? So such as, again, with relation to this point here, in the short run, all I can change is my labor. So if I'm producing way over here, I'm going to have too much labor. And if I'm producing over here, I would have too little labor, or alternatively, too much capital.
right, only at this point right there, this tangency point, would I have an optimal ratio such that marginal product of labor over price of labor equals my marginal product of capital over price of capital, right? That's only going to be true at the tangency point. Over here on the right, too much labor. So too much labor, that's going to cause my marginal product of labor to fall. So I would have this. Marginal product of labor is over price of labor is less than the marginal product of capital over the price of capital. And over on the left side, well, the opposite would be true. Too little labor. So marginal product of labor is actually high over price of labor, which is greater than my marginal product of capital over the price of capital. Right. And again, in this case here, I'm referring to say this point on that short run average total cost curve and with the yellow i'd be referring to say a point like this on my short run average total cost curve both of these cases because it's an inequality i am off of my long run average cost curve because of course the long run average cost curve is always at the optimal ratio so okay we saw let's just zoom out we saw our case on the left, we're operating in our decreasing costs below capacity. We're operating in our increasing costs above capacity. We have another point here. We could be operating at right here at our minimum efficient scale. And we could be operating right at our minimum efficient scale. Boom. Short run average total cost given a capital, let's say this is 100. At this point here, where are we? We are operating and we are tangent with our long run average, co long run average cost curve right at capacity. So below the minimum efficient scale, we're gonna be below capacity for that tangency point. At the minimum efficient scale, we're going to be at capacity for that tangency point. And then if we're when the increasing returns to scale, well, we're going to be above capacity for the tangency point. So we can see how these all kind of fit together and how our short run average total cost curves relate to the long run. Now, okay, seems like a whole bunch of theory, just seems like we drew a whole bunch of graphs. How is this relevant? What exactly do we want to do with this? Well, let's, let's take a look at a situation. Let's suppose that we have a firm and this firm is currently looking at the following. It's currently looking at the following. Uh, again, let's use the white. They're looking at the following costs in the short run. So let's say that we have a dollars per unit. We have units and we're going to, ah, let's just cheat. Let's just only use an abridged version of our cost curves here. I'm going to have my average total cost. I'm not drawing the average variable and I'm going to have my marginal cost there. And let's suppose that currently I am producing at a point like this. Oh, let's use an actual straight line. I'm producing at a point like this. And we can give it, you know, a name. We can say, hey, this is going to be a quantity of 50,000. And then we could say, okay, this is where the firm finds itself in the short run. All right, so this is our short run cost curves. If we really wanted to make sure that we knew this was the case, A, we don't have the long run average cost curve, but we could really drive it home by making sure we had this average variable cost. By having the average variable cost, we now know for sure, hey, vertical distance between the two means average fixed cost. Hey, fixed cost, capital's fixed, we're in the short run. 
Okay, so we're at Q equals 50,000. Suppose that we know farther that this firm is experiencing increasing returns to scale. So increasing returns to scale. And now, okay, management of this firm is getting together and they're trying to figure out, okay, in our five-year plan, what do we want to do with our capital? Do we want to be getting more capital? Do we need, do we have too much capital? What is going to be our ideal ratio of capital to labor? How do we want to change this? Well, okay. What we need to do in order to work through this is we need to place where are we on this average total cost curve, yellow line, and then where is this average total cost curve in relation to our long run average cost curve? So let's, let's take a look at that. Let's just scroll down and let's draw that guy. So I'm going to have my dollars per unit again. I'm going to have my number of units and I'm going to have my long run average cost. Uh, what? Right around there. That is my minimum efficient scale. Okay, so what did we say? We said, hey, this firm is experiencing increasing returns to scale. So, okay, first thing to do, where is this firm operating with respect to our long run? Well, this firm is operating with respect to our long run somewhere, uh, let's see a bit of a bigger line so that's a bit more clear, somewhere along here, right, where I'm making it green right now. This is our increasing returns to scale zone. So our firm is operating somewhere about here. So let's, let's just draw that in. Let's just, there we can zoom in a bit on our zone of interest. And let's just go tangent. There we go. That is my short run average total cost. You could imagine then we have coming up right through that minimum point there there'd be my marginal cost, and then underneath it somewhere we would have our average variable, but we don't need the average variable in our long run diagram. Reason why I drew that marginal cost is because right there, minimum average total, right where the marginal cost equals average total cost, this is our capacity. Okay, where were we on this short run average total cost, right? We said, hey, Right here is our tangency point. Actually, let's use a different color for that. Right there, that's our tangency point. That's where we have the optimal ratio such that marginal product of labor over price of labor equals marginal price of cap, sorry, marginal product of capital over price of capital. That's right there. Where were we though? Let's go take a look. We can zoom out a bit so that we can see that better. Okay, well, what do we have? Right here, that's the capacity of my firm. Right there, capacity. My yellow line, this was where we were actually producing. Well, this point here, this was to the right of capacity. I was producing above capacity. So, okay, let's, let's demonstrate that down here. We're operating above capacity. We're going to be operating to the right of this point. That is, I'm going to have some production point that is like this. Okay. So what are we going to do with this information? At this point, the white one right there, right? We can use a little laser pointer right there. This is where we have the optimal ratio of labor and capital. I want to be still producing this level of output, but I want to be producing it in a cost minimizing way. And I want to know what do I need to do with my capital? Well, in the short run, as I increased output beyond this point, well, in the short run, the only way I could do that was by increasing my labor. As I increased my labor, right? So maybe let's go 
as I increase my labor, labor goes up, marginal product of labor falls. As marginal product of labor falls, this whole term falls, meaning at my yellow point here, right at this point right there, I'm going to have marginal product of labor over price of labor, wage, that's going to be less than my marginal product of capital over my price of capital. I have too much labor. So in order to get to a cost minimizing way of producing that same amount of output, that is being able to produce right on my line here, what do I need to do? Well, I'm going to need to increase, uh, again, maybe not the best part to put that, I want to increase my capital and I might want to downsize some of my labor, make a little transition between those two. As I do this, what happens? Capital goes up, marginal product of capital falls, labor goes down, marginal product of labor goes up, and I'm going to make my way to a new, right? So it could answer the question, our long-term planning, we want more capital. And what's that going to do to us? More capital is going to shift this whole average total cost curve to tangent average total cost given my new level of capital. And okay, that got really ugly really fast, right? We're never going to want to actually graph all of this in this way to take a look at it. It's just kind of our demonstration is to take a look at, okay, how our short run transitions to the long run and how we can use this as kind of a planning tool in order to try to figure out what we ought to do. That is, do we want to get more or less capital as we move through time, depending on where we are, right? Hopefully that helped a little bit in taking a look at the ratios between labor and capital. Hopefully that helped to place where we are in the short run in relation to the long run. So let's suppose in this case here that we have a firm operating below capacity but experiencing increasing costs. Increasing costs in the long run. Given this, okay, so they're below capacity, but they're experiencing increasing costs in the long run. We can kind of place where they are on their short run average total cost curve, and we can place where they are on the long run average cost curve. And let's let's take a look at those. So let's draw it. Always our first step, right? Let's actually visualize what's happening here. We're gonna have our dollars per unit, we're gonna have our number of units, and we're gonna have our long run average cost curve. So, okay, we're experiencing increasing costs in the long run, and that's gonna put us somewhere along. Again, I'll just bold in it. Now let's just use the same color, make it bold in the same color. We're gonna be somewhere along here this is our increasing costs area. And I kind of doubled that up a bit much. Let's uh, see if we can do that better. We're going to be right along here. There we go. That was better. So let's pick a place to drop in our short run average total cost curve. Let's zoom into our area of interest. So our short run average total cost curve, it's going to come in. It's going to be tangent. It's going to hit a minimum. And then it's going to go that way, right? I just drew it backwards because it was easier to make our tangency point if I do it that way there. So, okay, we have our tangency point right there. Short run average total cost given some level of capital. And again, this here, this is the point where we have the optimal ratio of labor and capital. Cost minimizing. We have capacity, right? If you want to keep in mind, that is our marginal cost curve is passing right through that point. 
but we can keep our diagram a bit less cluttered. We'll just not include that curve in this case. What do we have? Well, we have in our case here, firm is operating below capacity, but experiencing increasing costs. So, okay, let's draw that. We're operating below capacity. Let's make our line for below capacity. Ah, uh, let's use a straight line tool, come on. There we go. So there we go, we're operating below capacity at this here, we can call that, I don't know, maybe this is in like 10,000 units maybe in this case. And we're gonna have the same question about this. We're gonna say, okay, management is sitting down, trying to figure out what to do with their capital stock. Do we have too much capital? Do we not have enough capital? That is, should we start selling off some of our capital or should we start to uh, buy some more? And then as we change our capital, what should we do with our labor force? Do we need more workers? Do we need fewer workers? What's kind of our long run plan as we transition from this short run to the next short run? Well, okay. Again, keep in mind, this short run average total cost curve, the only thing I can change in this is labor. My capital was fixed. If I had a perfect ratio at this tangency point, this level of output to decrease my output to our yellow line meant I was decreasing my labor force. That is, at this point, I have less labor than at my tangency point. If I have less labor, that means as labor goes down, my marginal product of labor goes up. So in relation to our equation here on the right, oh, doesn't quite show up, there we go. With respect to our equation here on the right, I could say that at this point here, uh, maybe let's make this line go up a bit more. There we go, at that point there, my marginal product of labor over my price of labor, that's gonna be greater than my marginal product of capital over my price of capital. That is, I'm getting more output per worker from the last worker hired than I am from my last piece of equipment. So based off of that, what I want more of, I want more workers, I want less capital. So what do I need to do as I transition to my next long run period? I'm going to decrease my capital stock I'm going to increase my labor force. As I do that, well, decreasing my capital stock will cause my marginal product of capital to rise. Increasing my labor force will cause my marginal product of labor to fall. Keep in mind all that's happening here, right? We have our isoquant. We have this trade-off between our capital and our labor. All we're wanting to do is just go from one point on this to another point. So in our case here, maybe we were, uh, let's do a straight line here. Maybe we were something like this to start. As we decrease our capital, let's switch to red for a new outcome. As we decreased our capital, the result is an increase in labor. So we had a trade-off in order to stay on the same isoquant, meaning the same quantity. As we went through that, okay, less capital, more marginal product of capital, more labor, less marginal product of labor. We're gonna get a new outcome such that our new marginal product of labor over the price of labor equals the marginal product of capital over the price of capital. And that means that we're gonna have a new point. Let's do my new average total cost curve in green. I'm gonna have a new one such that come through at a minimum, kind of coming my way back up. There we go, there's my new short run average total cost curve. There's my tangency point right there, such that I have this optimal ratio. Ah, actually look at that, I already had it right there. Right, there's my optimal ratio. And with respect to capacity, I'm still experiencing increasing costs. So with respect to capacity, I am still just operating slightly above capacity.
but I've rejigged my labor and capital in order to have this optimal ratio. And big thing with it, I decreased my capital stock. As I decreased my capital stock, this short run average hold cost curve shifted down to the left. Okay, another example there, working through our ratios of labor and capital and the transition from a short run to a long run with the optimal choice of labor and capital. Again, hope that helps. If you have any further questions about it, please feel free to drop me a line.